So today's sermon is Into the Deep. Follow Jesus into the deep. Those words come from the words of Jesus in our key passage today, which is Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. But before we turn to that passage of Scripture, and before we read that passage of Scripture, I want to pull back just a minute and give you a sense of where we are in the forest before we focus in on the particular tree for today. Big picture keys for Luke chapters 5 through 6, which of course, if you can count, follows Luke chapter 4, which was huge and pivotal, and we spent a lot of time on Luke chapter 4 from before Holy Week through Holy Week and up through last Sunday. Now we move on to Luke chapters 5 and 6, which are uh, literarily presented by Luke as a unit. I'll come back to that. Luke chapters 5 and 6. There are seven units there. And since we're just a mile away from Mississippi State University, I've decided to title this segment of Luke's Gospel the seven freshman units. The seven freshman units for being a disciple of Jesus, for actually being a Christian and a Christian who, in other words, follows Jesus. Seven freshman units in the school of following Jesus. So those of you who are professors, you may want to take some notes off of this as Luke gives us Jesus' teaching and as Luke presents it. Now, Jesus, of course, in these chapters is going to continue what we've already encountered and Luke has highlighted in chapter 4. Jesus' ministry of authoritative word preaching his main reason for coming, he tells us, um, as, as far as the execution of his ministry, and deeds that flow from his preaching, from his word. So authoritative word and authoritative actions or deeds. But further now, in these couple chapters and in these seven units, we're going to see that Jesus moves his ministry to a new stage. And on the one hand, it's more public, even more public than before even more public than what we encountered even at the close of chapter 4 of Luke's Gospel. But on the other hand, and this is where it gets really interesting for us, for those of us who would be Christians, who would be willing to kind of enter the freshman units, uh, he becomes, Jesus does, a lot more individualized and personal, focusing in on individual disciples as he begins to invest time in individual disciples disciples. In Luke chapters 5 and 6, we're going to see that, first of all, Jesus proactively does something and recruits his core disciples. Now, if you're Reformed and Presbyterian, you're going to like this, and you're going to be able to fill in the blank very easily. Anybody Reformed Presbyterian around here? Okay, so Jesus does what? How are we going to fill in that blank? Jesus proactively chooses and recruits his core disciples. Now, this is radical because most rabbis had people come to them and uh, petition and beg to become disciples, and then they would choose after people who had proactively come to them. Jesus chooses and goes out and basically catches and draws in his core disciples. And secondly, as we're going to see in Luke 5 and 6, Jesus moves on. Not only does he choose and recruit his core disciples, but later on, as we move to the end of, or towards the end of this segment of seven units, Jesus goes on and, and does what with 12 apostles? I wonder how the 12 apostles are going to be chosen. Do they have a congregational meeting and all the disciples, you know, and all the would-be disciples presented their candidates and then they voted on it and Jesus went out of the room. He was recused from the vote and then they brought Jesus back in and said, okay, here's your 12. No, Jesus does what? Jesus chooses 12 apostles. You can fill in the blank there. In Luke 5 and 6, Jesus then, after choosing and recruiting core disciples and after choosing the 12 of his apostles, does what? He thirdly preaches very specifically to his own disciples. This is the conclusion of these seven units in Luke 5 and 6, what's called the Sermon on the Plain. 
it's, it's similar to the Sermon on the Mount, not as extensive part of it, but Jesus is specifically looking to his disciples. Now, the larger crowds can listen in, but it's kind of like a children's sermon like Amy just did. You know, we're listening in, but the sermon or the message is specifically, in this case, specifically to Jesus' own disciples. So a lot of focus in the freshman series on actually becoming a personal disciple of Jesus. And Jesus is going to preach his didache, his instruction, as well as his judgment standards to his own disciples. Now, how do I come up with this seven units? Well, uh, you've got to look at the Greek, I think. It occurred to me, you know, it's, it's good to read the Greek. And so, um, you know, when I'm reading through Luke, uh, I'm, I'm going to be looking at the Greek as well. Y'all know this. And so when you actually like step back and start reading through segments, swaths of the Greek, mo- many of you were in Greek houses at college, so you also read Greek. You know what I'm talking about, right? I'm sure the Greek houses, that's where you study Greek, right? Makes sense. So um, agenito. Agenito is your key marker in six of the seven units. And, and catch this now. We sometimes are aware how John frames out threes and sevens and tens and twelves, and particularly sevens. Y'all know this, right, in in John's Gospel? Luke also does it. He's just not as obvious in some cases. Here we go. Here's a seven. So there's three agenitos. That's a a, a form of the verb, genomai. Agenito means it came about. The King James does a good job of translating this as it came to pass. Some of y'all will remember that kind of language. It came to pass, okay? Uh, the ESV, honestly, is a little bit weak on this. But anyway, uh, the, the, it, doesn't, it doesn't mark about for you. But it came to pass. There's three on one side and three on the other. Well, that draws my attention to the middle one, right? And how does the middle one start? Kaimeta Talta, Kaimeta Talta, which is... Um, and after these things, and after this. So we're really supposed to pay attention in all these, and it came to pass, this middle one. We'll get to that one. And let me tell you what the key climactic verse is. It frames and illuminates this entire segment of seven units. The key verse that closes out the fourth, y'all catch me, the central one, that doesn't begin with agenito, it begins with uh, kai metatalta, okay? At the close, Here's what Jesus says when they're complaining to him about eating with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus says this to the Pharisees, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come not to call, I haven't come to call the so-called righteous, but I wonder what's gonna go in that blank. Can you help me with that blank? You need to know this word. We've highlighted it in worship so far. It is the central cutting issue in this whole group of seven, okay? So what is it? The issue of sinners. I've come to call not the so-called righteous, the people who think they're already good church people. I've come to call sinners to repentance. Now, let me tell you, Luke uses the terminology of sinners three times as much as Mark and Matthew do. He uses this language a lot, and it's right here in the middle of us, telling us this whole segment, this whole freshman unit of seven uh, units is big on the issue of sinners. And Jesus' pronouncement statement, we get another one of these pronouncements of what is Jesus doing here? What's his ministry all about? I have come to call not the righteous, not the people who think they're good, but I've come to call sinners to repentance. Now, looking back kind of in the direction of our opening of the seven units today, the corresponding key verse and discipleship personal response in ours is going to be when Simon Peter falls down at Jesus' knees and says, depart from me, for I am a what? Sinful man. Simon says that. And then he says, O Lord. So, freshman units on being a Christian, a Christian disciple. Let's remember this as we head into our passage. If I am truly at least beginning to be an actual Christian, I mean, not just a spectator who comes to church, but a Christian, that means a disciple, somebody who follows Jesus, I am at least beginning to be awed 
by who Jesus is. We're going to see that in our passage. Awed by who Jesus is. Secondly, and this flows out of that, I am convicted and repentant about who I am. So I'm audited who he is, and I'm convicted and repentant and confessing about who I am. And then flowing from that, I will be obedient to his word, trusting and following him into the deep. So let's open with a prayer. We'll close with the prayer from the sermon today, too. But this pretty much introduces the prayer we'll turn to again at the close. But as we prepare to look at God's word, I want to invite you to pray this with me individually. Do it in your hearts before the Lord if, if you're feeling a call to be with Jesus. Lord Jesus, please give me eyes of faith to see who you really are. Let me be in awe of you. Lord Jesus, please wake me up spiritually. Bring me to conviction to confess that I am a sinner, O Holy Lord. Yet by your mercy, let me at your knees cling to you nevertheless and confess you as my Lord. Lord Jesus, please graciously call me to yourself. Inspire me to obey your word and to trust you into the deep, even to leave everything to follow you in your gospel mission. In your name, Jesus, I pray, amen. Now, our passage for today. Now, it came about, you remember that? It came about while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he, Jesus, was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were scrubbing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he, Jesus, asked him to put out a little from the land. Then having seated himself, he, Jesus, from the boat, taught the crowds. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, you, now this is singular, he's speaking directly, individually to Simon, you, put out into the deep, and now plural you, you all let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, after toiling all night, we took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and now their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they were beginning to sink. They're on the verge of sinking. But when Simon saw, he fell at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me because I am a sinful man, O Lord. For all had overwhelmed him and all who were with him at the catch of fish that they had taken. Now, likewise also James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, stop fearing. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought the boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So again, Luke 5, 1 through 11, the first in a series of seven freshman units in the school of following Jesus. God's revelation in this passage is about Jesus, obviously, but, but now we're really focusing for the first time ever on this guy who's been introduced in chapter 4 of Luke, a guy named Simon, or Simon Peter, as is later going to be called, and the issue of deep discipleship. This passage in Luke 
goes beyond, let me explain this now, it's not in conflict with, it goes beyond and supplements what we read about the initial kind of interest of and direction of John the Baptist to head Andrew, and therefore through Andrew, Simon, Peter, and, and later James and John and some other guys, Philip and Nathaniel, in the direction of being kind of disciples of Jesus. But they're kind of like, they seem to be kind of like an initial stage, like part-time They've applied to the school, and maybe they, they got the t-shirt, and maybe they hang out with Jesus a little bit, but they obviously are still fishing. So this also supplements and moves us beyond. This is a later episode to be read flowing from what we read in Matthew chapter 4 and Mark chapter 1 about them being by the shore and dropping their nets, leaving their boats, and following Jesus, but then they go back to fishing. And by the way, they're only on the shore. They're not in the deep. Luke really wants us to pay attention to that. They're just doing a little casting nets on the shore. Um, so here we are. We're going to move on with the story of Simon and, by extension, James and John in this passage. So this passage, and I'm delighted to be able to share this passage with you. I'm just kind of stunned in digging into this passage. I, I could give you more. I don't want to overwhelm you, but there's a lot here. So I could give you more of these, but this is Luke's, Luke's now, in Luke's gospel. Luke's first record of, first of all, Jesus' major public preaching outside the synagogues. That's a big deal. He's going outside the synagogues now to the unwashed crowds and the unwashed world. This passage also that we just read contains Luke's first record of Jesus' personal individualized, one-on-one -on -one disciple making. Our commission is to go and make disciples. Well, here Jesus is showing us how it's done. Okay, this is the initial round of this. Beginning with his commands, plural, light command, deep command, to Simon in this encounter. Third, this is Luke's gospel's first episode of the obedience of a chosen disciple to Jesus's word. Now, you may remember I highlighted this last week. The demons are obeying Jesus. They don't like Jesus, <laughs> but they profess him as, as the son of God. And when he tells them to get out, they get out. So they obey. But that's not certainly not saving faith or saving obedience. Now we've got an issue of an actual disciple obeying Jesus's word. New thing. First thing in Luke. Um, Luke's first record of an epiphany to one of Jesus' disciples. That's a big deal. It's the first time we get this to one of his disciples. Yes, we've had it to, you know, Simeon and Anna way back when Jesus is a baby. Yes, we've had the angelic host telling us this is an epiphany. So I don't know if the shepherds totally get what's going on or not. But this time, it's to one of his disciples. This is also Luke's first confession of by a sinner of both sin and faith. Now, this is the freshman year, folks. If you want to be a Christian, you really got to catch this one. I'll come back to that. Confession of both sin, my sin, and faith in him as Lord. Seventh, this is Luke's first record of Jesus himself giving a fear not. We've had angels do it. And when the angels do it, and without, you know, when God sends other people to do it, they say, fear not, and they don't just say, now go have a nice day and eat a hamburger. That's not what they say. They say, fear not, and God has a plan for you. Here's your commission. For instance, fear not, Mary. You're going to become pregnant. You're going to conceive by the Holy Spirit and give birth to the Son of God. I, I would say that's a pretty major commission after the fear not, right? Okay. So here, Jesus, though, is the one giving the fear not assurance, and Jesus is the one commissioning, and it's one of his disciples, Simon. And then eighth, three disciples, Simon, as well as James and John. Deep discipleship commitment, deep following commitment. So let's go into our passage. Uh, you remember it came about, so it came to pass. Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. Now, this is among the Gospels. This is unique or particular to Luke. Luke is more precise. He refers to this body of water like Josephus, the Jewish historian, does. 
they're a little more precise. They don't just use the colloquial terminology. This is not a saltwater sea, right? Y'all understand this. This is just a large freshwater lake. So Luke calls it a limne, okay? And he, he it's freshwater lake. And he refers to it as Gennesaret. That's the plain, the fertile plain. Gennesar means like a, a rich garden. The plain that, that cuts into the northwest area of the, you know, Lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum is on the lake's upper northwest shore. It's the last on the northwest side before you head up north, okay, cutting along the lake. It's the final, it's the key Galilean town on the northwest part of the lake before on the international highway known as the Via Maris. Remember Isaiah 9-1? the way of the sea. This is a big international highway all through ancient times. Goes from Egypt all the way up, you know, cuts across Carmel, the, the valley, and then up right north, and you can head to Damascus. This is along the Syro-African rift valley thing, and you're heading up, and then you're gonna go either up east toward Babylon or up northwest towards Asia Minor, Turkey, okay? So this is like a major international highway that bumps Capernaum. And with the political boundaries of Jesus' day, you're about to leave political territories. And so it's a major hub for commerce because fish is a luxury item in the Roman Empire. And there's really good fish from this lake. And they're heavily taxed, and commerce is heavily taxed. So you've got major taxing operations going on at Capernaum, and you're about to head in. If you go any, any northeast of there, you're into Golanitis, a totally separate territory. Um, so anyway, it, it's a big hub for international travel, for commerce. It's not just a podunk town. This is a big international area. It's mainly Jewish, but it's international. Lots of different cross-cultural stuff going on here, here, here too. So it's a hub for Jesus' mission. There's a reason Isaiah prophesied this. There's a reason Jesus sets his home base at Capernaum um, along the way of the sea. Okay, so I've already told you about again, uh, that, that means now, now, day, uh, but now. Uh, it came about, it came to pass, now it happened. Let me ask you this. Do things in life just happen? What does Luke want us to see when he keeps repeating this language? Now it came about. Who caused it to come about? Who causes things to come about in your life? in your children's life, in your friend's life? Just random cells in motion? No, God. And Jesus specifically is putting this in motion. So I really, the, the ESV is really weak on this for me. Not only does it not set it off for on one occasion, come on, give me a break, ESV. It came about, it happened. Now, it came about while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear. But the way, okay, so that's, that's what fills in that blank. But they're really just listening. Like, look, if you come to church and you come to a Bible study and just kind of listen, but the word is not on fire in your heart, you're, you're just kind of listening. You're just kind of a spectator. You're not actually on the team. Okay? You're not actually claimed. You understand what I'm saying? So this crowd, this crowd is listening to Jesus. They're fascinated by his authoritative word, but a lot of them are going to turn on Jesus later. You see, there's a difference between all in with Jesus and just kind of, wow, he's a pretty good speaker. He's got some interesting thoughts. Maybe I'll do a little devotional today. It's a big difference. So uh, they are astonished at his teaching, and Jesus has said, I must preach the good news to like all the towns. And it turns out not just in the synagogues, but out in the unwashed masses, you know, too. So they're pressing in on him because they want to hear the word. Now, these fishermen that we're going to turn to now, they had just disembarked and are scrubbing their nets. These are trammel nets. These are the multi-layered multi-nets that have all the weights on them. 
This is what you, this is not the little casting net and this is not a drag net. We're not talking shore fishing. We're talking deep into the waters fishing. And that's what they've been doing all night. And it's a big operation to scrub these nets with all the weights and everything. Okay, the night is over, it's daytime. Jesus is preaching. And um, they've disembarked, they've disembarked. Um, and, and here they are. And they're worn out. They're scrubbing these trammel nets. I'll come back to that. Getting into one of the boats, which happens to be Simon's. Does it just happen that Jesus gets into Simon's boat? What do you think? No. He chooses Simon's boat. And by the way, Simon and them are being good part-time disciples while they're scrubbing their nets. They're listening to Jesus preach. Kind of like sometimes while I'm driving, I might listen to a Bible story. Yeah, Jesus, I'm kind of with you, but I'm also driving and I'm also doing this, that, and the other thing, and I'm making my kids lunch and this, that, and the other thing. Nothing wrong with that, but that's, that's kind of the stage they're at. Getting into one of the boats, Simon's, Jesus asked Simon to put out a little from the land. Small command this time. Small command, nice little command. But you know what? If you're faithful with a little, he's going to give you more. So if you don't want in, you may want to beg off right now. Sorry, Jesus, I'm busy. I don't believe in all this stuff. Simon obeys the little command. He's going to give a little bit of time to Jesus now. He's worked all night, no fish anyway. And Jesus sits in Simon's boat and teaches the crowd from the boat. Now, 18th and 19th century critics of the Bible jumped all over this passage and relating passages about Jesus, you know, being in a boat, preaching to masses of people along the shore. Not possible they cannot hear him. Well, guess what? Um, uh, this was acoustically studied in, this, in the 20th century. There's this location with a little hub, a little inlet. I hope we can show you. There's, I've got pictures for you. Uh, there is a U-shaped inlet between Capernaum and Tab. Uh, Tabga, okay, these two little towns on the, the shore of Galilee. Tabga is down below Capernaum, and it creates a natural amphitheater. Do y'all see that? And, and then the, the land rises up above the little U-shaped thing. Can y'all see that? Okay, <laughs> that's between Capernaum and Tabga. I, I've got a little map there for you. It's referred to by people who take tours there now called the Sower's Cove, okay? And they have tested this, and you can put over a thousand people on that cove and have somebody out in a boat, you know, near the shore, and people can hear them because it's a natural amphitheater. All right, um, so when he finished speaking, he, Jesus, told Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets. You, Peter, Simon. Second singular, you, I want you out in the deep. And y'all, I want y'all to put down your nets. Okay, now, five, verse five. Something, after toiling all night, we took nothing. How is Simon at this stage referring to Jesus? The term here in the Greek, epistates, epistata, that means like the one who stands over, boss man. That means like, you know, by extension, it could be used of a rabbi. Okay, you're my teacher. You're the professor. I guess I have to do this. Um, after toiling all night, this doesn't make sense. My men are tired. We need to go home and sleep. We need some food. But, okay, you're the boss. You're the one who stands over us. You're the rabbi. I guess we'll do it at your word. But catch this now. It's not just that. I asked Dean yesterday when he came back from doing mission work in Amory, would you have liked it if I had said, okay, now I want you all to go back to Amory. You missed a spot. We're going to go back. You, Maddie, we're going to have to spend the next 12 hours back at Amory. Would that have been fun to you? But it's not just that here with Simon Peter and, and with his crew and with James and John. It's even more crazy. Trammel net fishing doesn't work in the daylight. The fish can see those big old honking weighted nets. These are multiple nets though, not just the single cast net. This is what they're gonna do. This is in the deep, this is what you do. The fish can see. 
We didn't catch a single fish all night when it actually works. And you want us to go out in full broad daylight into the deep and waste our time out there when we're really tired and hungry and need some sleep? You want us to go out there with something impossible, foolish, foolhardy, put down our trammel nets in the deep waters. But I know about your word. I'm starting to learn about your word. At your word, boss, rabbi, professor, I will let down the nets. And now we come to the authority of Jesus' word for real over creation. Not just over delivering people from demons, not just healing a person with cancer or blindness, but over all creation, including fish and those other fish known as human beings. Because that's what we're talking about here. And this is the first abundance miracle. Now, y'all need to understand this. These abundance miracles by Jesus are not... He didn't come down and say, you know, these fishermen need a little extra money. Martin needs a bonus this year. We need a little bit of extra scholarship money this year. This is not what Jesus is doing. This is a prophetic sign, not only about who Jesus is, but about the mission. These abundance mir miracles are about the mission to which we're called also. If you want to be an actual disciple, move into at least freshman year, you need to understand this. This first abundance miracle in Luke's gospel is a clear prophetic sign, not only about Jesus' authority over all creation, but also his abundance giving grace in the catch, in the harvest that actually matters. It's not about fish that are gonna die and be eaten and gone tomorrow. This is about the salvation of human souls. Okay, and then it happens, right? I mean, their nets are tearing up. They're almost to sink. Because, and the, you know, James and John are over there now, too. I mean, it's overwhelming. And everybody can see at one level what's happening. This is bizarre. This is a major miracle. This just does not happen. But apparently, Simon really sees, or at least begins to. But having, what goes in that blank? Having seen. Are you going through life looking at things or are you actually seeing God and what God's doing? Having seen. Simon Peter fell down where? Fell down under the fish? Jumped off the boat because he's so freaked out? What, what, what does Simon do? He fell down at... Jesus' knees. He doesn't just kneel down. He falls down at Jesus' knees. Okay, I want you to picture this now. Disciple or would-be disciple. He's at Jesus' knees. Okay, got it? Simon Peter fell at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me because I am. Here's that word. Will you say it? We finally get a disciple to say it. First time ever in Luke's gospel. I am a... Sinner, I'm a sinful man, I'm a sinner. Depart from me because I am a sinful man, Lord. Now remember, he's earlier used like master kind of language. Now he uses kurios. Now it's true, etymologically, if you look at kurios, you can have a mild just sir, person of high authority. But in Luke's gospel, every time, he's used it 30 times now, Kyrios, and he's either talking about God or Christological prophecies about Jesus being the very Son of God, Christ Lord's, okay, so Christ the Lord. Y'all remember this, right? This is what the angel says, right, to the shepherds, right? That kind of language. The mother of my Lord, when, 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 when Elizabeth says that, she's talking about something higher than the mother of my boss or something like that. This is high-level stuff. So... Because I am a sinful man, Lord. This is first time from a disciple in Luke's gospel. And God is waiting for you to say it to Jesus too. Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. Um, the men, the anthropos there is not particular to males, that means males and females, and it also means not just Jews, by the way, by implication. So we're talking about catching all kinds of people, all humanity. 
But the thing that's interesting here, even more so in the language, is the zogron. So greo means to catch alive. Did you hear that? What do fishermen normally want to do? They want to kill and eat fish. And Jesus says, no, 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 you're on a different kind of mission now. You catch alive to save. So let's go back through this. Jesus chooses and calls Simon. Simon attends to and obeys Jesus' word. Are you obeying Jesus' word? He does it small scale. He's willing to give his boat for a while for the talk. And then he does a big scale. Okay, it makes no sense, but I'll go out into the deep and do what you say, even though there's no way possible, humanly possible, it's going to happen. He obeys Jesus' command into the deep. He sees with eyes of faith, and he falls at Jesus' knees, confessing himself a sinner while clinging to Jesus as his Lord. He confesses Jesus as Lord, clings to him, and receives from Jesus the fear not, and God's not wasting his time with you. He's got a commission for you. Are you a Christian? He's got a commission for you. He gives the commission. So, summarizing now, we'll work through these over the next number of Sundays. Reed's going to preach a Sunday coming up. Dean's going to preach a Sunday coming up. But the seven freshman units in Luke 5 and 6 overall, here's, here's the thing. Sinners are called by Jesus. They confess Jesus. They confess to Jesus. They confess about Jesus. They cling to Jesus. Those who do that, you need not be afraid of Jesus or his holiness or his power. Do you hear what I'm saying? You don't have to be afraid of Jesus. Don't stay away from him. Cling to him. Because Jesus seeks, saves, and sends sinners. Children, y'all can get this on that little kind of form that says, what's the main myth? Jesus seeks, saves, and sends sinners in his mission, in his service. Jesus seeks, saves, and sends sinners to serve him. Got it? That's Luke 5 through 6. Uh, repentant sinners to catch alive other sinners for him. Isn't that great? We're supposed to catch other sinners for him. Not the people who think they're righteous, but other sinners. So if I am truly at least a beginning Christian disciple, I am beginning to see and be in awe of who Jesus is, confess who I am, a sinner, yet cling to him as Lord, and obey his word and follow him into the deep, into the mission. So let's close with a prayer or a series of prayers now. Let's pray. Open your heart to the Lord. If he's calling you, I invite you to pray and know his saving grace. Lord Jesus, please give me eyes of faith to see who you really are. I'm in awe of you. Let me be more and more in awe of you. I repent. I fall at your knees and confess I'm a sinner, O holy Lord. Yet at your knees, I cling to you and confess you as my Lord. Lord Jesus, please graciously call me to yourself. Inspire me to obey your word and trust you into the deep. I will leave everything and follow you. I'll leave everything, whatever you ask me to do, and follow you in your gospel mission to save sinners. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.